Hey guys, Sarah here. So today I'm going to be doing a deep dive on the scaleless gene and corn snakes. Uh, I know that this is, I, I mentioned that I'd be doing this a few videos ago when I did the micro scale video. And so I'm going to go ahead and do the scaleless video for you guys. You have kind of both coming out close to the same time. I know it was a few weeks ago, but uh, they're pretty close to each other. So uh, before I get into it though, uh, if you have not subscribed, please do. I know that only like 40% of the audience that views me is subscribed. So if you've watched a couple of videos already, you're probably going to watch a few more. So please just hit the subscribe button. I am doing corn snake content once a week for you guys. So um, if you want anything specific, just leave it in the comments below and I will definitely get to it at some point. And I also try to respond to every single comment. Uh, I may not get to every single comment, uh, but I definitely try. I get on the app every single day and I go through comments that haven't been uh, replied to and I'll go through and try to reply to each of them, especially if they are questions about, you know, different morphs or whatever. So leave a comment, subscribe, share, do all the fun stuff. Uh, okay, getting into the scaleless G mutation. Uh, it was a little bit difficult for me to remember how everything went down with scaleless and even trying to do the research for it. I remember originally it was really difficult and again I'm doing and repeating that research and it's even more difficult now because it's been years since I did that original research. I am referring to uh, my book, my actual my, first book. I have two different corn snake books. The first one is over all of the base mutations, mostly the histories of them with some brief descriptions and photos of each of the base mutations. Uh, base mutations just being like the single gene mutations. And then the other book is over the selectively bred morphs and localities and stuff like that. So scaleless actually originated, we believe, around 2005 in France. And this actually originated either from uh, just a pure MRI breeding. If you don't know what MRI means, uh, that's the Great Plains rat snake, which used to be considered a subspecies of corn snake. Uh, it was either by a pure MRI breeding that produced a scaleless, or it was between a corn snake and an MRI rat snake, and that breeding produced a scaleless hybrid that they then took and so it just continued to breed into corn snakes. So anytime you see a scaleless, het scaleless, scaleless lines, anything like that, uh, those are technically going to be hybrids with the MRI rat snake. Uh, now one of these days I'm going to do a deep dive on uh, the MRI and corn snake cross and what all of the names mean. You've probably heard of root beer, you've probably heard of creamsicle. A few that you may not have heard of is creamsicle or maybe cinnamon. These are all names for the corn snake, MRI, rat snake hybrids, the different morphs that you'll see in corn snakes. Um, I'm not going to get into that super deep right now, but I do want to let you know that anything that originated in scaleless is a technically a hybrid. Now, like I said, corn snakes used to be a subspecies, or I'm sorry, MRI used to be a subspecies of corn. Uh, and then they only somewhat recently, I believe it was maybe in the 90s, uh, the taxonomists kind of decided that they were two different things. So, um, you know, people don't really care too much if there's MRI in the line. Uh, I have found that any of my snakes that do have MRI in the line, they tend to be a little bit more aggressive, uh, but that's just... MRIs are a little bit more, they just are a little bit more aggressive. So um, just kind of an overview of all of that. Uh, obviously, scaleless removes the scales on a corn snake. Uh, I know that that is, seems really obvious. Now, what is interesting about the scale removal is that not all of the scales are actually removed. Uh, all of the scales on the belly remain. They are slightly misshapen, very similar to the micro scale uh, corn snake bellies but um, they are there, which means that the snakes do have the ability to produce at least some scales, which is different than the scaleless ball pythons and a few other scaleless uh, species or species that have a scaleless mutation. Um, so scaleless ball pythons have no scales at all, which means in order for them to produce at all, uh, you actually have to physically cut the egg open before the snake is ready to hatch, where it's not typically that way with scaleless corn snakes. Now, if I was going to be producing scaleless corn snakes, I personally would probably go ahead and cut the eggs open around the 62, 63 day mark. That's just me personally. Um, but I have seen uh, scaleless snakes, they do actually have sort of around the mouth uh, a layer of scales and that's where the egg tooth is that allows them to cut the egg open themselves. So that would probably not be necessary for the majority of scaleless corn snakes. Uh, and of course the question with that is, if we don't cut the eggs, uh, or I'm sorry, if we do cut the eggs 
for babies that don't have an egg tooth and then those babies grow up and breed um, would they produce more babies that do not have an egg tooth and do we want to continue that line of things um, of course my answer would be no it would probably be better for um, one to drown in the egg than for all of its progeny to require human assistance to survive um, when I say survive I mean like hatch just in general uh, you know they say that about like moths that are butterflies that are coming out of the cocoon uh, you should not help them even if they struggle because if they are not strong enough to even get out of their own cocoon then um, you don't want them to be breeding and then producing progeny that are not strong enough to get out of their cocoons in the future so that's just sort of something to think about um, and a, a lot of breeders think about that the morality of cutting eggs uh, I don't want to get in to that whole thing but uh, it is something that I felt like I needed to at least touch on since we're talking about snakes that may not even produce an egg tooth um, I personally don't have any issues with scaleless themselves. A lot of people do. A lot of people, if you mention scaleless, they're like, oh no, that's an abomination. We don't touch that. But then you get people on the other side of the argument that say, well, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the amelanistic corn snake was considered to be that. Or, um, you know, the there's other, there's other things out there that people were like, oh no, we don't want to continue to breed that because that's going to be a problem. And then it turns out that it's not a problem and it's actually something that we wanted to continue to breed for, like amelanism. The person who produced uh, the first amelanistic corn snakes uh, wasn't even really sure if he should continue to produce them. Uh, a lot of them were called. Uh, and it turns out that um, obviously we still have amelanistic corn snakes now. Uh, and what's interesting is if they had continued to call the amelanistic corn snakes, we may still have amelanistic uh, in corn snakes now because of the amelanistic emory gene, which is different from the corn snake amelanistic. They're separate. So if you have a, an amelanistic emory eye and then an amelanistic corn snake and you breed them together, you get uh, just root beers that are uh, hep for both. So that's just another interesting tidbit of information that I hope you wanted. I'm going to continue with the scaleless corn snake uh, information though. So um, the original scaleless was produced in 2005 in France and then BHB brought it over shortly thereafter. Uh, I want to say a couple years after. Um, BHB got a few um, a few baby scaleless, I believe, or, or maybe a yearling or an adult, something like that. Uh, I don't remember the exact age of the snake or snakes that he got, but I do know that he was the one who got the first ones and started producing the first ones in the U.S. And just from there, it has just grown. Um, a lot of people really like having the scaleless. Uh, I've never had a scaleless. I've had a few hat scaleless here and there that I always intended to breed, but then something would happen in my personal life, like I'd have to move or, you know, I was, I'm getting married like right now and um, some projects had to fall by the wayside. And so I've personally never produced scaleless. I've never really had that much of a passion for it, which is why it was always the first one to go. So I would, you know, purchase the snakes in a project, getting ready to produce scaleless and then something would happen and I'd say, well, I don't have a huge passion for this project specifically, so they would be the first ones to be sold. Um, However, I do think that they're very cool. I don't really see anything ethically wrong with them personally, uh, but everybody does have their own opinion on this. Uh, a few things that I recently learned about scaleless that other people in the past have known that um, I've just now in my most recent research found out uh, is that scaleless corn snakes actually, and scaleless snakes in general, actually do not have any issues with uh, losing too much water or losing too much heat. Uh, there was a lot of speculation and there have been articles. I will link the articles that I have down below, but there was a lot of speculation when scaleless was first produced, whether or not um, it's ethical just because of how comfortable or uncomfortable the snake might be. Uh, does the snake dehydrate faster than uh, other types of snakes that actually do have scales? And the answer is no. Uh, they don't seem to lose more water. They seem to generally be fine and they actually don't lose any more heat than a scaled snake. So um, as far as the heat and the hydration goes, you're fine. Now they don't produce as much beta keratin and that's part of the reason why they don't have any scales. But um, generally speaking, that doesn't seem to affect their health. As far as we can tell, uh, scaleless snakes can live just as long as any other snake. 
especially in captivity. Uh, maybe in the wild they'd have a little bit more of a difficult time because they don't have that protection. However, there are a lot of scaleless snakes found in the wild. I want to say about once a year or, or so, I hear about a wild-caught scaleless snake of some species or another, whether it's a water snake, a garter snake, a rat snake. So uh, it does happen. Scaleless snakes happen in the wild, and uh, some of them even live to adulthood just fine. So uh, the question is, like, how unnatural is it really? Um, and I would, you know, I would personally say it's not unnatural. I mean, we didn't go out of our way to produce the original mutation. It just happened naturally, and it happens naturally in the wild all the time. Uh, we just don't always see it. So um, whether natural is ethical is a whole other philosophical discussion. And if any of you would like to actually get into that discussion, I would love to. I majored in philosophy in college, so, um, you know, prepare for the logic to come at you if you want to do that. Um, I just really love debate, so if anybody would love to debate me, just let me know. The next really cool fun fact that I recently found out about Scaleless is the one that I announced in the Microscale video. If you haven't seen that, please go watch it. Uh, and, and that is that Microscale and Scaleless are actually allelic to each other. So if you breed a Microscale to a Scaleless, you get 100% of these uh, very weird, partially scaled, partially not scaled, um, Microscale weird looking corn snakes. Uh, and I think that that's really awesome. Um, and it's going to open up a lot for the future for people who uh, maybe don't want scaleless corn snakes, but want something that's a little more different than a micro scale even. So uh, I look forward, like I said, to seeing how that works out in the future. It was wire forest reptiles that actually did this breeding and they announced it um, somewhere around the 5th of August 2021 that they had bred these two gene mutations together uh, in some capacity. I think it might have been a visual to a het, but regardless, um, was proven, of course, that scaleless and micro scale are allelic to each other. So now we have all these allelic pairs. We have the scaleless and micro scale, a and ultra, uh, motley and stripe, sort of, uh, Yes, but also kind of that's a weird one. Uh, and then Castagna and Sunrise, Hypo Strawberry, and Christmas, if Christmas even exists. Uh, so yeah, it's really cool that we finally have this like uh, other, you know, allelic pair. I think that's really awesome. I think it's really cool to see the progression of the history of all of these morphs come together in such an interesting way. So uh, if you think about the timeline here, so Scalus has been around since about 2005, and then 10 years later in 2015, that's when a micro scale was proven to be a recessive mutation. Uh, and then here we are in 2021, uh, it took, you know, another, what, six years on top of that to uh, finally get these two gene mutations together long enough to prove that they were allelic with each other. So it's just really interesting to know that, you know, it was 16 years ago that we found we had the original scaleless. I just think it's really interesting to think about this timeline, uh, especially when you think about that scaleless is... Uh, either a hybrid mutation in itself where it was the two, you know, Amyl and Emory coming together and that sort of triggered the mutation to happen in, uh, as scaleless originally, uh, or it was originally an Emory mutation that um, was brought into corns. Uh, however, Microscale was a pure corn snake mutation that was through Miami lines. And to think that these two, uh, that, that this allele or this locus, the gene that sits on this locus, uh, was mutated two separate times, 10 years apart, uh, in just slightly different ways and yet compatible with each other. I find that to be super fascinating. So, um, now you kind of get an idea of what goes on in my head, especially when it comes to genetics and things like that. I think that's the thing that I love about corn snakes the most. Uh, I obviously love them as pets, uh, and I love to watch other people smile when they purchase snakes from me. Uh, but oddly enough, the thing that I love the most is just trying to figure out the genetics and the statistics and, and just looking over all of those things. So 
all in all, when it comes to scaleless corn snakes, obviously, there are some people who are adamantly opposed to them being in any breeding project. Uh, when I shared the other day the information on the scaleless and the micro scale being compatible with each other, uh, even just me sharing it, I had a few people comment and say, like, I would never want them in a breeding project. And uh, I'm like, well, you're definitely, like, you're allowed to feel that way. Uh, and a lot of people have felt that way about it for a long time. I don't necessarily feel that way. I just don't love them enough to do a whole lot with them. I think that one thing that's really cool about them, but also very confusing, is how different the pattern seems to be on them. Um, they don't seem to look like a normal corn snake. Like if you see a diffused, it's hard to know if it's a diffused. If you see a motley, it's hard to know if it's a motley. Uh, if you see a normal, it's hard to know that it's a normal. And the most interesting one, in my opinion, is actually the lavender one. Uh, if you have a lavender scale list, it actually looks more just like a hypomelanistic uh, because lavender actually happens within the scales. Lavender is a scale mutation. Lavender is not a, um, a pigment mutation which I think is really interesting. If you'd like to hear more about all of that, I did do a deep dive video on that in the past. I will link that above for you guys. Uh, it doesn't have uh, all the photos and stuff on it, but only because I, at the time, didn't have all the, you know, knickknacks that I needed on my computer to get that done instead of, as opposed to now, where I do have the at least capability to show you guys photos. Um, I am noticing that I'm getting old, like I'm 30 now, and um, like certain things about technology, I'm like, I don't know what this is. And I mean, it's gonna be even worse when I have kids and those kids are teenagers and they're gonna be like, mom, what do you mean you don't know how to use a hologram? <laughs> It happens, you know, uh, but I'm doing my best here. I'm hoping that you guys really like the videos. I think that's all I have to say about Scaleless, so just remember to subscribe, like the video, and uh, share it with anybody who you think might think is interesting. Anybody who you think might think it is interesting. Have a great day, guys. I'll see you in the next video.